I uh, just want to thank Formation for giving me the opportunity to talk here, and I'm always looking forward to talking to all of you as well. Uh, today's talk doesn't have any slides. What I'm going to do is a live demo of how I do development. And the example I'm going to use is um, programming, programming and deploying a simple CI-like server that for now will just listen to GitHub webhooks. And that's about what I can get done in about 45 minutes and have enough time to explain what's going on. At the end of the talk, I'll also show a slightly more complete version containing it also responding to webhooks, such as like commenting on a pull request that was open, for example. And so, well, and so the three tools I'm going to be using along the way are my trusty editor, which is Vim, uh, Cabal for all Haskell-related development, and NixOps for everything Nix-specific. So I'm going to use Haskell to write the CI server, and I'm going to use Nix to deploy it. And I need to be able to use Nix to deploy it because I can't run it off my laptop. GitHub, GitHub's not going to be able to send a webhook to my laptop that I'm running here, so it needs to be out on the wide internet in order for GitHub to be able to reach it. All right, so the way I began all these projects is Cabal in it. Uh, oh yeah, so I need GHC. So uh, I, one, one thing I like about Nix is that you don't really need to install anything globally. Very often I'll just install things transiently. So I'll say, that. Sorry. Yeah. why do you use Cabal rather than Stack? Um, the main reason is because Cabal integrates better with Nix. So if you, so Nix can provide not only the compiler, but also it can provide the Haskell packages. And if you use Cabal, it will pick up those Haskell packages correctly. If you use Stack, you can use Nix to provide the native dependencies, but Stack will insist on using its own Haskell packages. So uh, although I, Ian was saying right before this talk that they're working on making Stack integrate better with Nix so that it can pick up the packages provided by Nix. Um, I don't have any, uh, so actually when I'm not using Nix, I actually slightly prefer Stack. It has a nicer user experience and it's easier to teach to beginners. Um, but for more expert-friendly development, I, like, I really like to use Nix because you can uh, you get a lot more control, not only over the Haskell dependencies, but over your non-Haskell dependencies as well. And it also integrates well with things like CI and deploying servers and so forth. So it's, it gives you like the cool picture, whereas like Haskell is just confined to one project. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So when I, here I can say, first off, you can create uh, shells. Uh, so I can say, I, I want to create a shell with GAC in it just so I can run this command. Uh, actually, I can say, within that shell, run Cabal in it, because that's really all I need to do at the moment. And then it will set up the Cabal project and ask me a few questions. So there's some package name, default. I like all my projects to be in version 1.0.0, because I feel like you shouldn't release a project if it isn't version 1.0. <laughs> uh, I have a BSD3 license. That's my name. That's my email. No URL, no synopsis. I don't care about the category. I'm going to create an executable package, uh, main.hs. I like to use the source directory. I don't like it in the top level. And I don't need comments to the Kabbalah file. All right, and so now I've got an empty Haskell project populated in my directory, and here we have an example source.main.hs. So how do I compile this? So uh, because I like to use Nix a lot, I can actually use Nix to provide all the Haskell dependencies, but I have to do a few things first in order to tie things up. If I were to just do Cabal build right now, it would fail. I don't know exactly how, but yeah, for example, there's no GHC present, right? But you can hook up Cabal with Nix by taking advantage of a little feature, which is that in your Kabbalah config, if you add this nix colon true flag to it, then basically it will run all Kabbalah commands inside of a nix shell, and where that nix shell provides the Haskell compiler and any packages. But in order to do so, you need to basically set up all that nix logic. And this is most of the boilerplate of setting up a new project. So what I'm doing right here is I'm creating a nix configuration, which will contain all the nix logic for how to build this Haskell package. And this configuration can have lots of options that you can set, but the key options that I'm interested in setting is just overriding the set of Haskell packages. Specifically, I want to override it to include my package, which I'm building right now. And this is boilerplate, which you got to memorize or look up. I have actually, a, I have a tutorial on GitHub, which you can, if you're not sure how to do this, it's called Haskell Nix. It's a repository which shows you how you can do commercial development using a combination of Haskell and Nix, and it walks through how to do exactly what I'm about to show you right now. So if you want to look it up later, that's what you can do. Haskell package is new. I like to give things long names for clarity. And then I'm just going to add one, one Haskell package to the Haskell package set. And it's going to be the current package, and I'll just, that will be here. So I have not yet created this default.nix file. One cool thing about Nix is that 
It's a build language that lets you, where files can import other files. So I can say the logic for how to build this specific package will reside in some default.nix file, which I'm about to create. And then, I, and so to actually create that file, I just say koala to nix, I get my current directory, and then write that out to here. And lastly, I need the shell.nix, which will tie things together. So that will say, create, in, create a gigantic package set, which is lazily computed based off of that configuration, which I just specified. And then out of that package set, build the Haskell package named simple CI and give me the environment for Nix shell. So if all goes well, then if I type cabal configure, <laughs> it should pick up that Nix shell, build, uh, get the right version of GHC, get all the right version of the Haskell packages, and then I should be able to build the cabal project. And so if I were doing this for the first time, this stuff would take a little bit longer. Like you would first have to like, uh, if, it, if GHC is present in the public cache, it'll just download that. Same thing for all the Haskell packages, it will just download them from a binary cache. If you're on like a weird version of GHC or some older versions of packages, then it would build whatever was not in the public cache. Um, because I did some dry runs of this talk ahead of time, all this stuff is already in my cache, so I didn't have to build anything. That's why this took this went much uh, more quickly. That's one nice thing about using Nix over Stack, which is that in Stack, yeah, the very first time you use a resolver, you have to build all packages from source the first time. Whereas in Nix, if they're in the public cache, you can just download them. And so it looks like everything went well, so I'm going to build the project just to make sure everything's connected together. Okay, good. And of course, I can run it, call, run, and it prints, hello, Haskell. All right. So the next thing I need to do is I'm going to be using a Cabal REPL to quickly type check things as I go. So I'm actually going to, in a separate window right here, here one second, I'm going to create some smaller windows just for quicker feedback. Well, I'm going to use this more for, since it's larger and easier for you to see, I'll use this as the main development window. So here I'm just going to get a Cabal REPL going. So like anytime I want to type check it, it's ready to go. So if I want to type check, I just say, I, you can't see that, but I'm typing colon R right here for reload. And then if, if everything passes, then that means my project type checks. Uh, one of the reasons I really love Haskell is that uh, I can catch errors much more quickly because you can imagine that if I wait for a deploy cycle to find an error in production, that's a very slow iteration time. So I would like to catch things much more quickly on the, order, on the time, on time scales of seconds rather than minutes to know that you know, I made a typo in some file or whatever. Um, so that's one reason I really love Haskell, that it's really great for faster feedback uh, compared to like dynamically typed languages. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we want to make this, so right now this is not even a service, it's just an executable, but I want to at least start getting it on some server in the wild just to show how that's done. And then we'll actually turn it into a real service. So, and the reason why is because if we go to how GitHub works, so here I created an example test repository I'm going to be using for debugging. And for any Git repository, if you go to the settings page, uh, let me make this a little bit bigger. There. Uh, there's an option called webhooks. And here you can see the webhook I created from the last time. I'm actually going to just kind of reuse this because that has some useful payloads, which I want to redeploy up one second. Sorry. So all you need to do to specify in webhook is first the, the, the URL and port of your server, maybe an optional path if you want, the content type for the payload that GitHub will send, in this case, JSON, um, and then the events you want to subscribe to. So here I'm just going to say I only want to subscribe to pull requests, events. I don't, I don't care about anything else. Uh, you can also ask for everything and we'll send you everything. And then you would just click update webhook. <coughs> and then anytime there's a webhook, it will send a post request to that service at whatever path you specified uh, with some JSON payload. And we can actually see what those payloads look like really quickly. So here it keeps a log of previous payloads that it had sent. So here, for example, is a payload for opening a pull request. And so you can see here are the headers for that pull request payload. Here's the JSON. And what's really cool about the GitHub user interface is that you can also just say, re-deliver this payload. So like, you, let's say you're, you tried to trigger something, the server parsed it wrong or whatever, and you would say, I want to get a second chance. I don't want to have to like create a whole new branch on GitHub in order to test my change. You can just re-deliver the payload, which is very convenient. Um, but we can't do this unless we give it a server to contact. So that's what the next step is going to be. And so to deploy the server, I'm going to use a tool called NixOps, which is the Nix operations tool. And the way NixOps is idiomatically used is you will typically provide two files, one which is called um, logical.nix, which contains the hardware independent specification for your deployment. So things like what programs you're running, um, what services you're starting, what timers or some other system configuration parameters you might set. 
And then there's another file which may, might be called physical Linux, which contains hardware dependent settings. So like what machine am I deploying to? Am I deploying to EC2 or to a virtual box VM or to a pre-existing host that's already been allocated for me? And so we're gonna do the exact same thing. And specifically I wanna to deploy to an EC2 T2 Nano instance. And so the NixOps manual has some examples that you can just cargo pull from if you don't want to remember how to do it. So here we have a deploy to, in this case, Amazon EC2. There we go. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this. It's, it's actually pretty close to what I already want. Oops, sorry. Let me, let me learn how to highlight things. There we go. So I'm gonna save that to physical.nix. And then the only thing I'm gonna change is the region that I want. So I want US, West. And I don't want M1 small instance, I want T2 Nano, which is the smallest instance that it provides. Second, I'm not gonna be deploying. So in NixOps, you can, you can have deploy multiple machines and you can specify the configuration per machine in this way. So here it's saying that all three machines are gonna be EC2 machines for the same configuration. I only need one machine, so I'm just gonna delete two and call, and call this one very uncreatively machine. And that's my physical specification. And then I'm gonna create a logical specification which is just going to be, and actually I can just make it blank. Say, let's just deploy a blank machine for right now just to get the wheels turning while, just so we can start getting it, deploying the server and uploading things. Cause I don't know exactly how long it's gonna take to upload whatever binaries it needs to the machine. So I'm gonna kick that off right now. So I'm gonna say NixOps create, I'm sorry, NixOps create deployment. And I'm gonna call this simple CI. And I just give it the two files that I want the deployment to be based on. And then it'll remember that those files, so I don't have to specify them again for subsequent commands. Okay, and then hopefully this will work. And I say NixOps deployment, the NixOps deploy simple CI. This will provision the servers and then update them. They're gonna be blank servers. Oh, I have to specify um, the, sorry. There's one other thing I need to change for the physical configuration which is I need to specify what, um, what header my AWS access keys are located under in my AWS configuration. So I'm not gonna show you my AWS configuration because it's secret, but normally when you set up AWS for the first time, you'll create a file using either the AWS tools or you can also just create it manually, cribbing from a template, which in, which in, it'll be this AWS credentials file. There'll be some header like default or whatever you want to call it. And underneath that, you'll specify your uh, access key ID and or some other secret access key. Um, and then once you do that, then that gives you the credentials to um, purchase instances for deployment. And T2 Nano instances are so cheap that, yeah, that's what I'm going to do for this presentation. All right, so now that I specified that correctly, then hopefully this should work. There we go. So it's creating a, a unique here pair for this deployment. It's, uh, and then it's initializing the deployment with that. And if you're new to NixOps, basically anything that's prefixed by the name of a machine is a command that's being run on that machine. Anything that's not prefixed by the name of a machine is something that's being run locally. So here, all these you're seeing right now is being run on that machine. And I'm gonna let it get going. And then while it's going, I'm gonna go ahead and start doing development on the server because it might take some time to actually deploy things. So let me just do that here. And let's start doing some development. We can just watch it run in the background. Okay, there we go. All right, so the first thing we need to do is, so we gotta pick a Haskell library for writing a service. And there's a lot of options available uh, for writing Haskell, Haskell servers. Um, the lowest level option, there's two, <laughs> two lowest level options, um, warp and um, snap. Those are the most common ones, which are like the base of various web server frameworks. And warp is the, the more commonly used of the two as the base server. Um, and there's several libraries that build on top of the two. Um, so I'm not gonna use the low level warp library, mainly because I don't have enough time in this talk to do like detailed error handling. So I'm instead gonna use the servant library, which is a server library specifically dedicated towards um, creating REST-like uh, APIs. Uh, typically it's not, it, you could use it for like creating like an actual web page for users, but it's more commonly used just for APIs. If you're interested more in more building web pages, I think that's something that uh, Yisod is very commonly used for, for example. Um, the reason I like Servant is just because like I don't really have to think about error handling. Uh, it does a lot of that for me. I just specify a type and then a handler for that type, and then it takes care of all the status codes and errors for me. So, but in order to use the Servant library, I need to actually depend on it. And this is probably one of the most painful things about bootstrapping a new Haskell project is just specifying your dependencies uh, and importing them. 
Uh, so you're going to be you see, I'm spending a lot of time doing that in the very first part of this project. All right. And also, in general, when you're, so I don't know how people like find things for Haskell. Like some people use Google or some other tooling. I use Google. So I usually, whenever I'm looking for anything, I just search for Hackage and the name of that thing. So like if I'm looking for the servant library, I'll just search for Hackage Servant. Oh, oops, I mistyped it, but it's good enough. <laughs> or if I'm looking for a specific function, like, I don't know, um, decode UTFA, I'll just search for Hackage decode UTFA. And very often that'll take me to where I need to go for that function. And Google's probably better than this. I, I just never used it yet because Google thinks good enough for my purposes. Um, so um, I don't expect you to be familiar with Servant, but the basic idea behind it is that you create a type which resembles your, your an API specification. So it's similar in spirit to Swagger, if you've ever used that. Uh, Swagger is like a language independent specification for API so that you can um, auto-generate bindings for like the servers or the clients. Uh, Servant is the same thing, but, sort, but more specialized to Haskell. And you can actually do things like generate Swagger APIs from the Servant definition or the other way around, I think, although I've never tried it. Um, so here I'm gonna create an API definition for the GitHub webhook. And actually, so let me give you an example. Uh, this is not going to be the exact thing we're going to use, but I'll just show you an example of what an API might look like. So it could be something like, you know, for the path endpoint name users, you want to, so that it'll be something like users capture user ID as an integer. And then this is an endpoint that, ex that expects, that returns a JSON, I don't know, user, right? Something like that. And if you're using like more idiomatic notation, it would be something like users colon user ID with the post methods, something like that. So, and what Servant will do is that you, you can then do something like, say, I'm gonna create a server of type server API. And this server thing you see here is a type level function. So the input to this function is the API and the output is a, the type that our server's handler should be. So for example, if I said I need to capture a user ID of type integer and I need to return a user, uh, a user result, then my server type will actually be equivalent to something like integer to handler user, right? And I just need to write a function of that type and Servant will hook it up and serve that as the API. Now the actual API we're gonna be serving is much simpler than that because this is just a webhook. So in practice, our webhook is actually gonna be something like this. So first off, like we're gonna just use the root path, right? I'm not, I'm not gonna bother specifying a path underneath that. Um, but we do need to specify what the request payload shape is gonna be and what the response payload shape is gonna be. So in Servant, the way you do that is you use the request body. And actually, by the way, I need to import stuff. So I'm just gonna do an open import here. So for Servant and Servant.Server, I almost, I basically never do open imports in my actual projects. I'm only doing it because this is a presentation and I want to move more quickly. I tend to prefer either explicit unqualified imports or fully qualified imports. So for these two, I'm just going to leave open because I'm using a lot of things from both of these imports. Another thing I need to do is that because I'm doing type level programming, I need to have the ability to specify type level values like strings. So I'm going to enable the data kinds extension and also a type operators, that's our extension, and I'm anal about aligning things. <laughs> okay, so the request body, so this right here is actually a type level list. Uh, not, this is not the list type, this is like an actual list value that has one JSON constructor stored inside of it. Um, so the request body has a type JSON. I think I, I, think I have to give it uh, a type. So the request body, I'm just gonna call it a, um, what am I, I don't even know what to call this. Uh, payload, request, whatever, request. And then also I need to specify what the method type is gonna be. It's gonna be a post. It's gonna also return JSON. And then, I don't know, just response. Very on. And the only, re so the only requirement service is gonna impose is that whatever these two types are, they need to implement um, either from JSON or to JSON, uh, depending on whether or not it's the input or the output. <laughs> or if you don't want to even do that, you can just use the value type from Haskell's ESON library, which is just like the weakly typed, you know, object that resembles like what you would use in other languages. So that means we're going to need another dependency, which is the ESON library. So I'm going to need specifically from JSON and to JSON. So we're going to add that to set of dependencies, ESON. Oh, it looks like, so in the background, server's finished. So we'll get back to that in just a second, but so far it's succeeded. Where am I? Okay, so 
The other thing we're going to need to do is, well, one cool feature about Haskell is that you can actually automatically generate translations between JSON and Haskell data types. And I'm going to be using that, again, because I don't want to do error handling in the middle of this presentation. It's going to be, we don't have enough time for that. So I'm just going to say declare two types, request. And for right now, request is going to be an empty type. We'll specify more later. So deriving from, uh, sort of generic. And then that, in turn, lets me derive from JSON. And so in order to do that, I got to enable two more extensions, derive generic, and derive any class, and got to align things. <laughs> and then same thing for, oh, I, I, should, I should probably invest some time in improving my IDE. <laughs> I, I, I'm very, I'm a very late adopter when it comes to editors and editor plugins. Uh, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I'm a very early adopter when it comes to programming languages. <laughs> um, all right, so that should be, so oh, one more thing I need to import, uh, JC. By the way, does anybody know of an editor that automatically handles not only imports, but dependencies for you? Like if I add, if like my reference generic would automatically add the import and add the dependency? Is there something like that? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think there was. If there is one, I would switch it in heartbeat uh, to use it. Um, okay, so where was I? I think this is correct. Okay, I think that's probably correct. <laughs> and so the other thing I need is I also need to extract the header. And the reason why is because the only way I know, which actually, so technically I don't need to extract the header because I already asked to filter things by pull request. But I just want to show how you would get the header just for completeness. Um, so in Servant, you would just add that to your specification. Say there's going to be a header uh, whose who's header type is x GitHub event. And then the value is going to be, it can be any type that implements a certain type plus interface. Um, but I'm just going to say it's text because, again, that's good enough for right now. And so what I would expect is that if I apply is this. Is that meant to be a function arrow or is that, is that in the type there? Hmm? Is that meant to be a function arrow actually or is that a, should that be a servant arrow? Oh, yeah, that should be a, a servant thing. That's correct. Thank you. See, who needs an ID when you have your audience? <laughs> so I expect, so this server type will function, I would expect it to give something like this type right here. Server, uh, sorry, it'll be a function from maybe text, because the header might be, uh, if it, it'll be nothing if the header was, uh, was absent, and present, like just, te just some text value if the header is present with that value. And then I expect there to be a request passed, which was decoded from the JSON payload. And then it'll be a type handler, and then the response. And then it'll take care of encoding that response as JSON and sending it back. And actually, if we're not sure, I believe you can even check in the REPL what that evaluates to, although I didn't practice this before the talk. So if it doesn't work, I'm just going to skip it. Um, let's see if the Cabal REPL <coughs> works. Oh, wait, sorry. I need to update my dependencies. So the, way I, so the way I will do that is before every Cabal REPL invocation, I will just basically do this. So it'll always make sure I'm picking up the latest dependencies I added to my Cabal file. Um, what's going on here? One second. You have the source file. You made a mistake in the Cabal file. Source it still depends on it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah, I need to depend on text. Okay, so again, I kind of wish this kind of thing was done automatically for me, but it's better than finding out at runtime. Fingers crossed. Yay. Okay. So I think the trick to doing this would be some. I think it's called like kind server and then webhook. Yes, so that basically tells you what's the equivalent type when you expand it out, right? So that's, uh, you can also, I can also just basically use that as the type. Uh, so either of those would be valid. Uh, let me just, there. I'll just leave that for clarity. Okay, so now we need to write the handler. So I'm gonna say, okay, if the contents of the header are just pull request, okay, and then I need to get the actual request, which I'll just call it request. And then right now I'll just, whatever, do nothing. And then otherwise I will fail, oops, okay. And then again, 
think you want several web right? uh, API. Oh yes, webhook. <laughs> I'm gonna find out in just a second. In fact, that's probably good. So let me actually in another get this get the REPL going in another window so I can easily just have it always keep it running. Okay. What what you use unit for uh, response? Oh yeah, I can use unit as a response too. Um, so for example, if I don't care about returning anything, there, like that. So that is that will also work as well, in which case, yeah, it, it'll be that right there. Um, and, okay, so let's fix that really quickly. Webhook, then reload. Okay, oh yeah, I need to turn on overloaded strings, which I think is one of the best Haskell extensions out there. It should be, I mean, there, there are good reasons why it's not the default, but I pretty much always enable it. Okay, there we go, we're good. All right, and so now let's uh, deploy the service just to show that. So in the background, I'm gonna start deploying that service. So again, let me just create another window so we can start doing that in the background and keep REPL open too. Wait a second. Okay, so. All right, so Nix, sorry, NixOps deploy, deployment, simple CI, and that should be just it. And for the first time, let's just walk through what's happening right here. So Nix, so Nix in general is kind of like make, right? You have this very, oh, so nothing actually changed. Uh, why did nothing change here? I know something. Oh, that's oh, sorry. It's because I never actually referenced it in my uh, logical specification. So now let's show how we can actually tie in the server we just built and in, into a service that's running on that server. So for example, so one thing that's cool thing about NixOS is it's basically like a unified configuration for everything you could possibly want to do on a server, including like integrations with lots of popular services. Um, so if you search for NixOS options, it'll take you to this cool page right here, which shows you like everything you can configure. Like if you want to like <laughs> spin up Apache Kafka on your server, you just turn it on and boom, it's going to download Apache Kafka, create a user and a service and give you the tools on the path and so forth. Um, but here I just want to create a systemd service. So I would search for like something like systemd, the actual hierarchy is systemd.services. And that's what I'm going to be using here. So systemd.services, and then you, this will be the name of the service. And then the minimal thing you need to spin up a systemd service is you need to specify what it's wanted by. In this case, we'll use multi-user.target. And then you need to specify what script will run. And what's cool is then I can actually have this depend directly on my Haskell executable. But I need to do two things. So first thing is I need to take that config, which I created before, and make it accessible to my logical configuration. So this will, this will basically teach NixOS how to build my Haskell service, which I just authored. And then I have to bring this packages, pkgs, or packages variable into scope, which basically is that gigantic record of every package we could possibly build. And I'm going to interpolate it here. So packages, the Haskell packages, simple CI slash bin slash uh, simple CI. I assume it's the name of the executable. And that should be it. And so let's see if that does, in fact, uh, well, let me just, okay. okay, so let's see if that deploys the service correctly. So this works. We should see it build a service, copy to the role machine. Uh, and then start the systemd service associated with it. And while this is, so Nix is kind of like make, but at a much larger scale. So if you're familiar with make, you know, you just, uh, you specify your build graph, and then anytime something changes, everything downstream of it is incrementally rebuilt. So this is the same thing. So I, so basically everything downstream of my Haskell executable is being rebuilt. So here, the, that's the actual Haskell project being built. And then now it's all building the set, the unit file for the systemd service right here. And then, this, well, the, and then downstream of that is, the set of units for the entire system. Downstream of that is the contents of the ETC directory. Downstream of that is the entire compressed system configuration to deploy to the service. And so here it's basically downloading. Oh, so actually I'm gonna stop it right here. And it's totally safe to stop a deploy in the middle of the deploy. And the reason why is because the Nix upgrades are atomic, meaning that um, you can't have like a half upgrade or an abort upgrade because the way Nix works is that anytime you do an upgrade, 
it just adds things which are totally isolated from each other in an append only immutable next door. And then it just changes once, and then it creates like a symlink farm. And then at the very end, the very last step is it just changes one symlink atomically, and that completely changes the entire system uh, in a safe way. So you can always cancel things, and it's totally safe. Um, the reason I cancel is because um, right now the project is going to build a dynamically linked Haskell uh, uh, Haskell binary by default, and I want to build a statically linked executable so it has a much smaller profile on the server. Because remember, like I'm using a T2 nano instance, so I want to use a very small footprint, and I also want to make the upload as cheap as possible. So I'm going to make one change to my configuration for how to build this executable. And I'm going to wrap this in a function called packages.haskell.lib.just static executables. So it just says, don't build anything else other than what you need, the bare minimum you need to get a statically linked executable, and then deploy that. And so uh, the advantage of that is that it's a much smaller footprint, much cheaper upload time, and it's very friendly for cheap um, hosting options. Um, and so actually, there's one thing that I never actually specified, which is that how are we building this, this Linux executable uh, for this service? Um, NixOps actually provides several options. Uh, the default is that NixOps will try to build on the target machine. Um, but in some cases, that doesn't work that well, um, specifically if you're using OS 10 and a multi-user Nix installation, it's actually really difficult to get working. So here, what I'm actually doing behind the hoods is I have a Linux VM running locally down here. And basically, I'm, uh, in Nix, you have the option of delegating builds to other machines. So I basically set up my Linux VM as a, as a build machine where I can just delegate anything Linux related to that. Um, so, so the actual Haskell executable is being built on that VM and copied back to my laptop and then copied to the target machine on EC2. So I don't have to build anything on the destination machine, which means I don't need the, the tool chain. I don't need to have GHC on the destination machine or anything, just the executable. So it's a very uh, lean way of deploying things. How do you specify? Like, how, how do you specify? Oh, how do you specify? Um, it's, so the, the easiest way to do it by far is if your development machine is a NixOS machine, because then there's several options. To, so like, let's go back to our set of NixOS options, right? So we, if we go to um, distributed, so yeah, here are the two options. So you, you turn on distributed builds, you just set that option to true, and then there's a build, and then you have the build machines uh, option hierarchy, which tells you like, what are, what's the address of the machine, what SSH user, what key you're gonna use what platforms it can support for building, how many jobs to build on it, and so forth. And then if you do that, it should just like set up everything for you, and then any builds will be delegated appropriately. Um, if you're not using NixOS, um, then you need to read the Nix manual, which basically tells you how to do this manually. So it involves like creating some files, setting some environment variables, and um, creating some signing keys and things like that. Which you've done because you're on Mac. Yeah, which I've done because I'm on Mac, yeah. So, um... Like, yeah. What's a NixOS machine? Where is that? Oh, so first off, the machine I'm deploying to is a NixOS machine. So NixOS is short for Nix Operating System. So it's an uh, it's operating system that is uh, has a immutable declarative functional specification. Um, the main uh, so probably the best way to learn about it is to go read the NixOS manual. And the Nix manuals are like really long but really good. And almost every problem I've ever run into in Nix was something where I said like I really should have read the manual because it explained how to solve this problem. Um, so Nix as a manual can probably sell this better than I can in the introduction. Here, one second. So is that a virtual machine? <laughs> uh, NixOS can be deployed as, no, it, 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 NixOS is the operating system, not the, um, not the, um, so you can deploy it to a physical machine or a virtual machine or, you know, EC2 or Google Cloud or whatever. Um, so the nice thing about it is like literally everything in the system is configured in the exact same way. So like in a lot of other systems, like, you know, in order to configure it, you need to learn about like how to configure Linux boot parameters or how to configure system D or how to configure, you know, Grub or how to configure ALSA. And they all have their own little, you know, bespoke configuration format that you got to learn anytime you want to change any option. And Nixos, everything is like the exact same format. So it's really easy to learn how to configure new things on it. The other advantage is that like um, upgrades are atomic, uh, integrates really well with the whole rest of the, uh, the Nix ecosystem, and also deploy tools like NixOps. And, uh, and you can also, like, so remember how I said that you can use distributed builds, right? So I can, anything, um, so the nice thing about Nix is I like all of Nix's features work for anything that you can build with Nix, right? So examples of features that, uh, that work well in Nix are distributed builds, binary caches, right? So my server is literally just yet just another Nix build product. So for example, then I can just um, I can build, cache, and serve that server ahead of time, just like any other package that I would uh, serve 
build or server cache in Nix. And I can delegate the build of my server just like any other thing I can delegate in Nix. Um, so that's actually one of the killer features of Nix is that the exact same abstraction span several layers of um, abstraction hierarchy, right? So like, I don't have to learn separate things for like operating systems or packages or systemd services or cluster deployment or containers, it's all one unified abstraction that works uh, composably at each level of the hierarchy. Um, so that's the, that's the mixed marketing uh, elevator pitch. So, <laughs> okay, so it looks like the deploy uh, works successfully. So I can now SSH into the server. So SSH deployment, simple CI, I'm just, sorry, machine, I need to type there, okay. Um, and then we can see, is the service successfully running? It should be, so the deployment would have erred if the service had uh, failed in any way. So yeah, it, we, it ran, it printed hello Haskell, and then it terminated successfully. So that's how we know that we've integrated our executable correctly into our deployment server. So the next thing we need to do is like, okay, we need to uh, actually, so we haven't actually run the server yet. So we just specified the, the, the type, but we didn't hook up any actual service. So uh, again, I don't really remember how to do this, so I'm just gonna go to the servant page, and so actually servant server is the package for how to, so the servant has three packages. It has servant, which is just the API specification, and then servant server is what translates that into a server, and servant client is what translates that into a client. So for example here, it basically tells you um, what are the things you need to import in order to use it. So the key thing I need is this right here. So I need to import the warp library, which is what provides. If I didn't know, if I didn't know what library provided this import, uh, again, like everything, I would just say package, that import name, and then there, that's the name of the package, it's warp, uh, just in case I didn't know. So and I, because I've done this ahead of time, I already know what the two packages I need are gonna be, and it's gonna be warp, and then WAAI. The reason there are two packages is that WAI is technically a web application interface. It was designed with the original intent that you could have like multiple server backends for the same interface. In practice, only one, I think, ever materialized, which is warp. So we just have to import two packages to do everything. So anyway, I like qualified imports for as many things as I can do. So I'm gonna import that qualify. I'm also gonna import network. Actually, I'm gonna import uh, all I need from the WA library is just the application type. Okay. So this is now going to become that.run port 8080. And then and you need the app. I like to use longer names. Application. That is going to have type application. And the application you think is like is a func is the request respond logic of the server. And in this case, we don't need to know because servant's gonna generate the application for us. The only thing we need is to use servant.server.serve. We need to use uh, the API. So this API right here would be something like this, proxy, proxy, webhook. I'm gonna inline it just for a second. And then this here would be the actual server that we just wrote about. Uh, one trick I like to avoid having to specify the word proxy twice is I'll just, use a cool extension called type applications. And then I can just say webhook there, and then it'll know which proxy I mean. Okay, so did I forget something? Let's find out. Type check, yes I did, I forgot to uh, reload my REPL. So let's try that again. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so everything type checks, so I should be able to deploy it. So, um, but before, uh, to avoid, uh, so the whole reason I use Haskell is to avoid having to deploy things to test things. So I'm gonna do as much, to keep this talk as short as possible, I'm gonna do as much iteration locally before I deploy, because each deploy is gonna take like a couple of minutes to build and then copy the executable. So let's get things as close as possible to where we think it's working and then we'll deploy and test it. <laughs> so let's look at the payload to see what we need to extract uh, from the request. So let's say I wanna just get the, pull request number, meaning so I can know what issue I want to comment on if I'm like some CI bot, right? So here I would say, okay, this is gonna have some pull request field of type pull request, and then it's gonna have, that is going to have a field called number of type number. There we go. And, uh, I think that should be, okay, then we need to actually do something with it. <laughs> and actually what I'll do is I'll just print it, and I also need to turn on 
debug mode for Servant, because Servant by default tries to be secure and you know, not log things that might be a security risk to have in your logs. If you want to turn on debug mode, we're actually not going to use Servant, but a lower level uh, WAI feature from the WAI extra package. So this package provides several useful um, middlewares, which, you, which are literally just functions between applications. And the middleware I want to use is this log standard out dev function. And you can literally see middleware is a function from an application to another application. So all I need to do is just call this function on my existing application, wherever it is. Here we go. So it's a first, I don't want to type all that. So that dot log standard out dev. I'm violating the golden 80 columns rule right here. And then import qualify that. And I also need to add that to my dependencies. Uh, WAI extra. Okay, again, let's see if that works. And so normally I would make a lot more mistakes than this. The only reason I'm making so few mistakes is because I've rehearsed this talk three times before doing it here. <laughs> you see a lot more type errors than this if I were doing this the very first time. Um, anyway, so I need to, now the next thing I need to do is I want to just print out the pull request number in this case. So instead of return, I'll just do lift IO because this handler is not IO. It's like some type which implements the Monet IO interface. Lift IO, print, uh, let's just print the, the full request. That means I need to derive show. Okay. okay, does that work? No, I need to import the lift IO function, which means I need another import. So this is actually one of my big gripes with the servant library, which is it doesn't re-export enough functionality for things like this. I wish it had like some convenience module for re-exporting things, so sorry. So I need to add transformers my dependencies and let's try this again that looks good okay so now let's see if we're receiving that webhook correct so now let's do the deploy okay fingers crossed so then the, so what we're going to do is while the deploy is going let's get the webhook ready okay now yeah there's nothing else to do so just wait so if this works correctly, we should be able to, actually one thing I'll do while the deploy is going is I'll log into the server really quickly. So nixops SSH, deployment, simple CI, my the machine. I'm gonna tail the logs of the server. There we go. So we'll be able to see when the server restarts. And so if this works, then we'll be done. <laughs> we can, and then we can move on to the next talk. And also, I'll do one more thing before we go, is just to show the full service. Also, using GitHub API as a client, so it can deposit a comment in response to the pull request. Uh, I won't code that live. I'll just show the complete code example. Okay, so it looks like the service started. So actually, before we go, let's just test it with curl to see what happens. Uh, I'll just do it in this window. Uh, so oh, wait, actually, I know it's going to fail because by default, um, only port 22 is open, and our service is listening on port 8080. So let's, if I want to add something to the firewall, again, go back to the NixOS options. Let's just search for firewall. And here I want allowed TCP ports. And so 22 will always be present. We can add to that list like this. So networking.firewall.allowed TCP, was it lowercase yep, capital, okay, TCP ports equals 8080, and that opens. Again, I don't have to learn the IP tables rules, right? This is all just one configuration format. You, you still want SSH too. I was right? going to say. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. So um, the reason, why, so SSH will still be on. And the reason why is because um, some NixOS options have, so NixOS options have types, and the types specify how you combine multiple duplicate definitions. Um, so for example, for the list, so if, a, if an option has type list, um, then by default, if you define it multiple times, it'll just concatenate the list. And so that 22 is already defined in some other module and it'll get concatenated with the 8080 to, to get the full set of ports. I also know because I tried it before, so I know that's going to work. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be locking myself out of the server, which I've done on many occasions, by the way. <laughs> How would you disable a port if you want to disable a port? Like if you didn't want SSH for some reason? Um, good question. So actually in NixOps, so let me, let me 
correct what I said. NixOps only enables port 22 by default for certain hardware, for certain physical profiles like EC2 or virtual machines. Um, if you're deploying to a pre-existing host, um, it will not enable any ports by default. And so if you don't include 22, you will lock yourself out of the machine. And that is one way I have locked myself out uh, historically. Um, okay, so now we're on, so we deploy the machine, the port should be open. So now let's just test that. So the curl, here's the address. We can also, if we don't know what the address is, we don't want, if you, or we didn't save the logs, it would be nixops info deployment, and then it'll tell us, uh, oh, sorry. Um, de wait, de oh yeah, deployment, simple CI, yeah. And then here, this is where you could get the IP address. And also, because we're deploying EC2, there is a, not a Nix OS option, but a Nix ops option to specify um, what, uh, to automatically provision a DNS address for the machine if you want. Um, so if you ever want to find the Nix ops options, that would be in the Nix ops manual, which is separate from the Nix OS manual. Um, so the IP address is here in this case. So I would say, okay, curl, um, post. Uh, I also need to specify its application. Let's, let's do it without application JSON header just to show that it will fail. So um, post, HTTP, that 8080, I expect, and then also some data file. So like, let's just do an empty JSON record. It's gonna, um, so let's do verbose so we can actually get the error. So it says, um, yeah, unsupported media type, because I didn't specify, servant is pretty strict, and because we specify we're, we want JSON, it looks for the application JSON header. And I honestly need to look up uh, how to get the application JSON header with Perl, a curl. Yeah, so I, I use Stack Overflow, so. <laughs> there we go. Because I also don't remember the exact uh, content type either. Okay, here, so now it's saying, it's giving a new error message, which is that we're missing the key pull request from the server. Before I continue, let's just go to the webhook and see if the webhook works. Um, okay, so now let's update the webhook so it uses the new server URL. Okay, that looks right. Okay, application JSON, webhook. And if it all works, I should be able to send this webhook and the server should log it. Yes, re-deliver this payload. And then let's look at the logs. Aha, success. So in this case, yeah, here's what came in. The request, pull request, number equals one. And this, but I know that I know that it's going to Although the server registers success, I know GitHub's going to register a failure because um, by default, GitHub is, oh no, it's just, it's a success. Never mind. <laughs> it succeeded. <laughs> and so really quickly, we're going to just show the remainder of the code example, just to show what that looks like. So I have that stored here. Some, that was from a previous run. Okay. So here's a more worked example. So here's the original webhook API. And then here is an example of me using the GitHub as a client. So, I, so GitHub requires the authorization header, a user agent, it's on the repos path. So the repos is one of the path components. The next path component is captured and it's called owner. Then the, then the, the name of the repo, then there's a new path component for issues, then the number of the issue you wanna update, then the comments, and then the actual comment payload. And the comment payload is just, a JSON with a single field called body text. Uh, and then the response would be like, you know, the ID in this case or something like that. Um, and then, so all we have to do to generate a client binding for the API is we just use the client function from the servant client library. We give it the type GitHub, and then it will generate an add comment uh, function, which I can call to invoke the API. And that's basically what's happening here. I'm basically providing the authorization, the user agent, my name, my repo, then the, and then the number extracted from the pull request that I got from the webhook, and then I, I post the comment to that, uh, to that pull request. And uh, that's it. Go to the top. Yeah. Any questions or? Yeah. Um. So I remember I, I tried uh, Nick Tops like uh, I think like two years ago maybe or something and I remember thinking it was super cool except 
there is no way to like manage it from more than one computer. So yes. you end up having like the master laptop and nothing else to manage it. Is that yes. still a thing? Yes, that is, that is yeah. still a problem with Mixhouse as far as I tell. We actually don't use Mixhouse at work to deploy things. So we provisions. Cool. So actually we have a, a tool at work called Nix Deploy, which is basically Nixops for deploying one machine. Uh, so all you actually need to do to deploy a NixOS machine is you, because when you, if you build the derivation for a NixOS machine, the resulting path will contain a switch to configuration script underneath it. And that's conceptually what NixOS rebuild is using is that script. So we wrote a deploy which basically wraps building a NixOS derivation, copying it to another machine, and then running that switch to configuration script, which is basically the minimal thing you need to, to deploy an already provisioned machine in this way. Um, so yeah, here, here's the repository if you want to use it. Um, yeah, that's cool. I feel like everybody would want to use it. Yeah, so it's open, it's open source, so feel free to use it. Oh, sorry, I didn't, yeah, I didn't share my screen. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, well, anyway, uh, it'll take a while for me to, to reattend. But yeah, it, uh, it, just look for nix-deploy on GitHub, and you'll be able to find it. Cool. Um, so my, so if you can't use that tool, my understanding is that some teams, they either, again, they use a master laptop or they have a, uh, a shared staging machine for launching deploys, or they'll use something like get crypt to encrypt like the shared state. I think that's actually a bad solution because I mean, I think they're all bad solution because they require shared access to a, a protected thing and you can't revoke uh, access to it for one person. So like that's, well, that's why we don't use it, but yeah. Yeah. So, are you pretty bullish on Nix then? You think it's? Like, oh yeah, I think I, I think Nix is fantastic. Yeah, I I'm very very bullish on Nix. Um, I think the main, if I had to pick one thing about Nix I really like is just the fact that it's composable. Meaning that um, the simple explanation of composable is that two derivations, which you can think of as things you can build, um, you can have. It's easy to, to author derivations that depend on other derivations, right? So, like, let's give you a counterexample, like Docker, right? So, in Docker, it's really difficult. Like, you can't take two com two containers and trivially combine them into a new container, right? So, typically, the way Docker works around this is like everything's a service, and you gotta make service calls between containers, right? Or Nix is really cheap to have things depend on lots of other things, and you just create again. It's like Mix, right? You just create this build graph, and Nix just manages everything for you. Um, so, I think that is like the really slick. Feature of Nix, and the reason it's important is that it ensures that as your system grows larger, it doesn't grow more complex. You always use the same tools, same programming language, um, same interface for everything, right? So I use I use Nix build for every single layer of the abstraction. I use distributed builds for every layer of the abstraction. I use caching and CI for every layer of the abstraction. My integration tests are just derivations that I can build and cache and redeploy. So, like for example, you know, Nix has a caching feature, right? So you know that if you build something a second time, it'll just be a cache hit, right? Same thing for integration tests. So if an integration test, if Nix detects that nothing in the integrations test uh, dependencies change, it'll be a cache hit and it won't rerun the test. So it's very intelligent about when you rerun tests and when you just uh, mark them as already succeeded, for example. And you mentioned earlier uh, you were talking about public cache. Is that something where there's literally a global public cache for Nix? Yes. That's for anything built with the same configuration, I'll just pull it down. Yes, so there's a public cache.nixos.org, which is installed by default when you install Nix. And um, yeah, if, if your derivation is present in the cache, it'll be pulled down from there. And you can also make your CI server, you can, you can turn anything into a cache. Like your, your, your machine can be a cache, which you can share with other people. Your CI server can be a cache. Um, the, the build machines for the CI servers can be cached. Everything can be turned into an ad hoc cache very easily. So. Uh, in fact, the NixOS has an option called nix-serve, which if you enable it, it just turns your machine into a cache. Oh, yeah. Uh, have you used server in production before, and what's your experience been like with it? Uh, no, we haven't. I don't think we've used server in full. No, so no, we don't really use server a lot. Uh, no, yes, sorry, sorry, we do. Uh, we do use it in one very important way. So um, at, at work, we actually use gRPC as the communication interface between services, but because our front, because front end in JavaScript doesn't have a native gRPC binding, we have a service which automatically translates gRPC interfaces to pseudo REST interfaces, which are like not REST-like or idiomatic at all. So basically like everything's a post request and it just like maps JSON to put above messages using a standard called um, JSON PB. Um, so that's all code generated uh, so that we don't have to maintain that mapping. Um, that's the, and, the, and the generated API is a servant API. Um, but in other cases, we use a gRPC API. 
And Servant, like the, the main reason we use it is just because it was easy. It was easy to use, and we didn't really need really sophisticated like error handling or uh, for it because it's an internal API. Like if it was a more public API, we might actually we we, we do use it for public APIs too. But again, like we didn't need, need really um, D shell control. Like we just the default was good enough for our case, which is why we used it. Yeah. How long in your first time a person was at this thing? <laughs> Three hours. <laughs> yes. And actually, the, the first time I did it, so I actually wasn't sure how, how exactly to go about it. So my first, my first tact was to use warp and then use JSON values directly, using like lens to navigate the JSON values. But then I had to do so much error handling, both for the warp and for um, lens ESON. I was like, no, you know, I, I'm not going to do this. Let's just use servant and. Um, drive from JSON or to JSON, and that went much more quickly. So actually, both approaches were within the three hours. Uh, but yeah, and then after that, the second try was about uh, an hour. But that was doing the full CI service, including like the comment handling and so forth. Uh, so yeah, that's probably what it took me. Hey, Will. Um, uh, Nix is extremely popular mm -hmm. and it like well among Haskellers, mm -hmm. um, can you speculate? Like you know, if we ignore Docker, mm -hmm. uh, will it ever become like, you know used with other languages? Do you think like why why it's not being used? But like what what stop it? Um, usually, so I think the languages it integrates best with are C, Haskell, and some recently uh, Python, and more recently. Um, JavaScript slash node via MTM to Nix. Um, we also used it for internally. We're actually just experimenting using it for Scala too. There's an SBTix project that actually worked for us, and we're probably going to switch to it. Um, I don't know for Java. I don't, think, I don't know if there's anything for Java per se. Um, yeah, it basically comes down to whether or not a language has an existing um, Nix integration or not. Like the reason why. Uh, so. Languages that have like a make-like build format, like like uh, I was like Go. Go is another language actually integrates pretty well with too. Um, anything that has like a make-like way of building things integrates pretty straightforwardly with Nix. If your language has like a really complicated tool, um, then I mean, let me put it this way: like integration means like efficient integration, right? In the worst case, like anything you can do in a shell script, you can do in a Nix derivation, right? So like the worst case scenario, you could just like wrap. A Java build with like whatever Java command you would use to run the build, and that's actually how we initially wrapped some of our Scala builds. We just like literally built our SPT project from scratch every time we did it, right? But it's not very efficient, right? If you use something like SBTix, you get much more incremental and inefficient uh, Nix builds because then basically every um, object in the SBT build gets its own Nix derivation, which is a much better uh, experience. So what we did initially, for example, for for Scala. Was that we use Nix for building it in CI, but then we would just use Nix shell to revision the development environment, and so that way people could still get incremental builds when doing development locally, but CI could build it from scratch. And it turned out that wasn't that was really not much worse than the way it was doing it before, because even before using Nix, our CI was already rebuilding it from scratch each time too. That was tech debt though. <laughs> um, so the point is, you can integrate with languages in a very crude way. It's just like a shell script that runs whatever package manager or build command you normally do. Um, but usually Nix tends to take off once it has much better integration with a uh, particular language. Yeah. So um, outside of NixOS and NixOps, um, you kind of need immutable infrastructure so that you don't you avoid like state in your infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. Um, it sort of feels like this is a different thing where you have a long lived infrastructure and it kind of has state in the sense that there's a Nix cache, mm -hmm. but the state doesn't really matter because it's like you can recreate it. Right. Um, so is this like you kind of you get fast deploys because you don't have to spin up a new EC2 instance, but you get all the benefits of the new infrastructure in that it's repeatable and it's immutable. Yes. Um, so yeah, the the yes. So Nix is uh, it's I, I think the, the key thing is that it, Nix is isolated, right? So um, like as as Russ people like to say, right? So Share, shared immutable is bad, right? So you either fix it by removing sharing or removing mutability, right? So in, in Nick's case, you do it just by, uh, in this case, re uh, removing mutability. So everything is immutable. And as a result, it's, if they share things in common, that it's totally safe because they're not going to mutate their shared dependency. So that's why you can just keep reusing the same infrastructure to deploy. You can deploy wildly different things. So like we have sometimes these long-lived um, um, physical hardware in our data center that will redeploy to lots of different 
you know, actual um, uh, configurations. It doesn't matter what was previously deployed uh, because like it, it's, again, they're isolated from each other because their dependencies are immutable. Um, so yeah, it's very safe to reuse infrastructure this way. You don't have to like destroy and repave systems to get the isolation guarantees that you would need with other ecosystems. It does seem like you're not practicing the, uh, the case where you lose the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel the need to occasionally destroy the long lived infrastructure just to make sure that the provisioning stuff still works? Um, I mean, again, we don't really use ops a lot at work. Um, I can tell you from my own personal projects, um, I, I usually don't feel like I need to exercise that path. Um, that's not a that's not a very common point. So the general rule of thumb is that like the nice thing about Nix is like if it works, it keeps working because it's it's much more deterministic than other things. So usually if it works the first time, I don't feel the need to like re-exercise it over and over just to make sure it, it hasn't gone bad since the last time I redeployed it because that's that almost never happens. Yeah. Um, when you get packages uh, installed from Nix, what like kind of versions are you getting? And maybe can you kind of like compare that to like how does it compare to getting it from like a stackage LPS yeah. version set? So Nix is very similar in spirit. So in spirit to stackage, meaning that it's a curated package set, not just for Haskell packages, but for native packages too. Um, and it's similar. It's also similar to stackage in that. Um, the latest mix packages tries to track the latest versions of all packages and then they tweak it as necessary to get things to build. So um, if you're on the latest mix, and also again, making an analogy to stackage, um, mix packages has releases like, you know, 1709, 1803, whatever. And each of those releases would be like analogous to an LTS resolver in stackage. Um, so you can either decide to, to like pin yourself to a stable LTS release, which is like what we do at work. We have a, we pin to a Nix packages revision that corresponds to one of its stable releases. Um, or you can track Nix packages on stable, which would be analogous to stackage nightly. And to get, if you want to get more recent versions of packages. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you.